How Hackers Almost Destroyed the Internet in 2025. The internet was supposed to be unbreakable. From its origins in the Pentagon's ARPANET, the entire architecture was built with redundancy in mind. Packets bouncing across multiple routes, nodes resilient against nuclear war, a network that could reroute itself around disaster. For decades, that promise of indestructibility reassured governments and corporations alike. But in 2025, the unthinkable nearly happened. A year-long cascade of cyber attacks spanning continents, ideologies, and criminal motives pushed the digital world closer to collapse than at any point in its history. It wasn't one singular strike. It was a chain reaction. An ISP reduced to rubble, backbone telecoms quietly infiltrated, a global social platform knocked flat, and even the basic functions of a U.S. city paralyzed. For the first time, the global community was forced to confront a grim reality. The internet is not invincible. The winter blackout. January in Russia is usually defined by frozen streets and biting winds. But in 2025, for thousands of customers in one corner of the country, it was the silence of dead screens that stood out. Nodex, a regional internet provider, simply stopped working. No access to emails, no online banking, no contact with relatives overseas. When engineers and executives tried to log into their systems, they discovered there was nothing to log into. Entire data centers had been wiped clean, servers erased as if scorched by digital fire. The culprit was later identified as the Ukrainian Cyber Alliance, a politically motivated hacking group that had been active since the early days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Their message was blunt. They had completely looted and destroyed Nodex. For the ISP, the damage was existential. They were forced to rebuild operations from scratch, relying on whatever backups they could salvage. For cybersecurity observers, this wasn't just another tit-for-tat strike in the digital theater of war. It was proof of concept. An ISP could be destroyed at the infrastructural level. Not disabled temporarily, not forced to pay ransom, destroyed. Salt Typhoon moves in. If Nodex was a sledgehammer strike, Salt Typhoon was a scalpel. The group, believed to be state-sponsored and linked to China, had spent months creeping into the heart of America's telecommunications infrastructure. They weren't targeting websites or databases, they were targeting the routers, the unseen boxes of blinking lights that direct trillions of packets every second. By the time U.S. investigators fully grasped the scale of the infiltration, Salt Typhoon had compromised nine of the largest telecom providers in the country, including giants like Verizon, ATAN DT, and T-Mobile. The terrifying part was what they didn't do. They didn't pull the plug. They didn't reroute traffic to black out entire regions. They watched. They collected metadata. They mapped the arteries of the digital age. In a way, it was worse than destruction. It was possession. The nightmare scenario, one FBI analyst later remarked, was waking up one morning and realizing they could shut down the internet in half the country if they wanted to. The U.S. government put a bounty of $10 million on information about the group's operators. But the damage was already done. Trust in the integrity of America's internet backbone was shaken, and the quiet knowledge lingered that foreign operatives had been inside, unseen, for months. The day the tweets stopped. March 2025 was when the crisis reached ordinary people. It started on a Friday afternoon. Timelines froze. Posts failed to load. Millions of users stared at their phones and laptops as the platform still widely called Twitter, by then rebranded X, sputtered and died. The cause, a massive distributed denial-of-service attack, DDoS. Hackers had harnessed an army of infected machines, pouring traffic into X's servers until they buckled. Videos failed to stream, news feeds refused to refresh, and one of the world's largest communication platforms fell silent. A collective calling itself the Dark Storm Team claimed credit, citing political motives tied to Middle Eastern conflicts. Some forensic traces pointed back to Eastern Europe, muddying attribution. What made the outage more alarming was the discovery that X's origin servers hadn't been properly shielded. Cloudflare and other protective systems should have absorbed the attack, but gaps in configuration left crucial servers exposed. It was a rookie error on a platform worth billions. For several hours, the global public square had been erased. Governments scrambled to push out emergency press releases through alternative channels. Newsrooms reverted to television and radio. It was a sobering moment. If one well-aimed attack could silence a social megaphone, 
What would happen if the same force was directed at financial exchanges or emergency networks? A city held hostage. Then came summer. On July 27th, the city of St. Paul, Minnesota declared a state of emergency. The cause wasn't a flood or a riot or a terrorist bomb, it was ransomware. The gang behind the attack, calling themselves Interlock, infiltrated the city's systems and locked officials out of vital services. Online bill payments stopped working. City employees were locked out of email. Even public Wi-Fi was disrupted. Interlock demanded ransom, threatening to release stolen data if ignored. City leaders refused. Days later, 43 gigabytes of sensitive documents were dumped online. Personnel records, contracts, financial files, suddenly all in the public domain. The disruption was so severe that the Minnesota National Guard was deployed to help restore basic services. Traffic systems faltered, emergency dispatch slowed, and City Hall ground to a halt. For the citizens of St. Paul, cyber warfare wasn't happening on some distant battlefield, it was unfolding on their streets. The pattern emerges. By the end of summer, analysts began to see the attacks not as isolated events but as parts of a wider pattern. Each incident revealed a different fault line in the global network, and together they painted a stark picture. Destruction at the access layer, Nodex's collapse showed that ISPs, the front doors to the internet for millions, could be annihilated outright. A handful of coordinated strikes on regional ISPs in multiple countries could easily leave millions in digital darkness. Compromise of the backbone, Salt Typhoon demonstrated that state actors weren't merely content to disrupt, they wanted control. Their infiltration of telecoms wasn't loud, it was quiet, and it meant that the most basic infrastructure of the internet could be surveilled or manipulated at will. Platform level fragility. X's outage highlighted how dependent the world had become on a few centralized mega platforms. Knocking one offline was no longer a matter of inconvenience, it was the silencing of global discourse. Municipal paralysis. St. Paul proved that ransomware was no longer a private sector problem. When cities fell victim, the disruption leapt from screens into streets, affecting real people's daily lives. What made this pattern dangerous was its layered nature. Each attack targeted a different tier of the Internet's architecture, access, backbone, application, and civic integration. Had two or three of these incidents coincided in the same week, the resulting disruption could have triggered cascading failures across borders. The Technical Fault Lines the near collapse of 2025 forced experts to confront uncomfortable truths about the Internet's design and its implementation. Legacy systems and technical debt. Many of the telecom routers compromised by Salt Typhoon were built on firmware that hadn't been patched in years. Some were running operating systems that predated the smartphone era. The cost of replacing them had been deemed too high until the cost of compromise became higher. Flat networks, poor segmentation, St. Paul's ransomware crisis revealed how municipal systems were often flat networks, where compromise of one service gave attackers pathways to others. Proper segmentation, walls between sensitive systems was missing or poorly enforced. Misconfigurations and human oversight, the DDoS against X laid bare how even trillion-dollar platforms could be felled by simple mistakes. Cloud protection only works if it is configured properly and administrators had left origin servers exposed. It wasn't advanced hacking, it was negligence. Weaponization of the digital commons, botnets used in the X attack were stitched together from poorly secured consumer devices, cameras, routers, even smart TVs. The so-called Internet of Things had effectively been turned into a global mercenary army of zombies. Taken together, these flaws painted a sobering picture. The fragility of the Internet wasn't the fault of a single flaw, but of accumulated neglect, patchwork defenses, and misplaced trust in systems too vast to truly police. Lessons and Warnings By autumn of 2025, the question wasn't whether the Internet could be broken. It was how close we had come to seeing it shatter. Governments rushed to pour billions into cybersecurity initiatives. ISPs and telecoms began the slow, expensive process of replacing hardware once considered good enough. Social media companies quietly hardened their networks, investing in redundancies they had long ignored. Cities across the U.S. began hiring cybersecurity directors for the first time. But the broader lesson was darker. The events of 2025 showed that the Internet does not collapse like a skyscraper in a single catastrophic moment. It crumbles like a bridge eaten away by rust quietly, section by section. 
until the whole thing buckles. And perhaps the most troubling takeaway was this. None of the groups that struck in 2025 acted in coordination. Hacktivists, criminals, and state-sponsored teams all pursued their own agendas. The real threat is what happens when those agendas align, intentionally or not. One European intelligence official put it bluntly, 2025 was a rehearsal, we survived, but it showed everyone from criminals to nations exactly how to aim for the jugular next time. Epilogue, the Internet's near-death experience. The Internet didn't die in 2025, but in the span of 12 months it experienced a near-death. The year pulled back the curtain on illusions of resilience and revealed the terrifying fragility beneath. For the billions who rely on it every day, the thought lingers. What happens next time?